وبعض الأقسام السورية الواقعة في غرب دمشق وحمص وحما وحلب ولا يمكن أن يقال عنها إنها عربية محضة كلمة الأقسام ترجمة غير صحيحة للكلمة الإنجليزية الكلمة في اللغة الإنجليزية هي districts أي مناطق أقضية يعني في عدة ترجمات ممكنة حسب شو كان بذهن الإنجليز بس أظن هم كان كانت رغبتهم McMahon was careful not to promise anything that contravened pre-existing treaty arrangements. They wished to exclude territories to the west of Homs, Hama and Damascus and Aleppo and certain areas around uh, the Gulf of Alexandretta and in Cilicia. And Britain was already in occupation of the province of Basra and much of the province of Baghdad at this time. And so Britain was very keen to declare its interest in retaining some degree of control over those territories uh, for the mutual benefit of the Arabs and the British. Beyond those boundaries that Britain would be willing to accept the Hashemite claim to Arab kingdom with British support. Hussein thought that uh, the British promised to include Palestine in his kingdom and the British later denied that they promised him Palestine. They denied it outright, but um, all the evidence is that they had promised him Palestine. طبعا إذا الواحد بيقرأ ال ال الرسائل البريطانية رسائل سر هنري مكمان للشريف حسين على ضوء ما نعلمه الآن من مفاوضات الإنجليز مع الفرنسوية وعلى ضوء فهمنا للطموحات البريطانية من الواضح إنه للإنجليز غايات عديدة في تدوين هذه الرسائل يعني كانوا يغطوا مصالحهم وكانوا يغطوا على اللي بيعملوه مع الفرنسوية Significantly, in the same month that the British promised parts of greater Syria to Sharif Hussein they told the French that any agreement relating to the borders of an Arab kingdom would not be finalized without their consent They knew how strong the French interest in Syria was. On the 1st of October, 1915, the French ambassador to Britain, Paul Cambon, wrote to his prime minister, René Viviani, to tell him that London had requested a French representative to draw the borders of an Arab kingdom with Syria. In this document, the French ambassador suggested François-Georges Picot who'd managed the general consulate in Beirut for over a year and knew the Syrian issue better than anyone else. Alors, François-Georges Picot est un diplomate. C'est un diplomate qui est un diplomate comme on les avait euh, à la fin du 19e siècle et au début du 20e siècle. C'est un personnage qui a euh, ses entrées au Quai d'Orsay parce que, en fait, son père, l'ensemble de sa famille est déjà euh, très intégré dans le système diplomatique français. Et ce sont des gens qui sont bien impliqués dans ce projet colonial asiatique et qui s'intéressent très naturellement à l'Asie. Alors il a eu un parcours de diplomate classique, c'est-à-dire qu'il se déplace de poste en poste. Et il se trouve que, par hasard, il est en Orient, à Beyrouth, 1914. Ah, Monsieur Picot. Bonjour, Monsieur. Bonjour. Very nice to see you again. Monsieur George. The French representative, Picot, had his first meeting with the British in London on the 23rd of November, 1915. They started their negotiations about their respective shares of the Ottoman Empire once the war was over. The British come along with an array of people from all the different ministries that take an interest, the war ministry, the foreign office, the colonial office, and they all are sitting on one side of the table and Pico is on the other side of the table. Perhaps you would define for us the boundaries your government desires. We must, of course, have the whole of Syria and Palestine. All of it? Of course, down to the Egyptian border. But, uh, Monsieur Pico, you must realise there are other claims in this area. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps, perhaps... Uh, the uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem could form a kind of enclave, but certainly no else. 
And despite the numerical advantage, Pico just sits there with his arms crossed and says, I'm not interested in your, your plan. It doesn't... We, we, we can't possibly accept something along the lines that you're talking about. Moving further east... We must have the land uh, north of this line and across here, including Mosul. Mosul? The town? No, no, the Vilayet, the whole area around it. Twenty years ago, the Vilayet of Mosul included the Baghdad and Basra districts. Are you suggesting they should be separated now? It is impossible to consider the situation of 20 years ago affecting the situation now. So, Monsieur Pico, if you have Palestine and Syria and half Iraq and Mosul, will you be satisfied? I think I can persuade my government. Then we have reached an impasse. The uncompromising positions of both sides at that first meeting caused the British Army intelligence officer in Cairo to write, It is obviously hopeless to attempt to arrive at any reasonable agreement with the French so long as Pico is their representative. François-Georges Picot, c'est lui qui se retrouve en fait au commissaire en 1916-1917, au commissaire pour la Syrie et la Cilicie, et qui, parce qu'en en fait il s'intéresse aux populations arabes, parce qu'il est plutôt anglophile, eh bien se retrouve à devoir négocier avec Mark Sykes, qui est la figure qui représente le lobby colonial britannique, et les deux hommes en fait vont être chargés d'élaborer ce qu'on appelle des buts de guerre. Et les accords Saïs-Pico sont typiquement ce qu'on appelle des buts de guerre, c'est-à-dire en cas de victoire, et seulement en cas de victoire, voilà comment on se partagera les territoires. Et il dessine en fait une carte d'un territoire qui n'existait pas et se partage en fait un monde qui est un monde quasiment désertique, c'est ce qu'on appelle les interlandes, et qui vont dessiner en fait les structures des pays d'aujourd'hui. Ce marque... Your government has been adopting extreme positions over a territory which you must recognize France has special claims to. But in the meetings I attended, no one seemed to give a centimeter. And yet, concessions, I feel, uh, are essential. Decisions have to be made so that we both know where we stand when Turkey is conquered, as inevitably it will be. Mr. Piku, I feel sure that within these walls, we can find a way through the issues. And my government has given me the power to make the necessary decisions. I too have been given the freedom by my government to make the necessary decisions. And you must realize that we have very definite needs in a territory which some of my countrymen consider to be French by rights, ever since the Crusades. Do you remember who won the Crusades? Uh, yes, but uh, today the Arabs have few uh, Saladins. Although these talks were secret, the Russians had already made their demands. What we must do, now that we have agreed the Russians can have the northern areas of Turkey, including the Straits, is to discuss the southern and eastern areas so that the interests of both our great nations can be established for the decades that will follow the end of the war. Well, let us start then with the provinces of Syria that center on Damascus and the Lebanon. لم يكون يمانع لأن المنطقة الشمالية المنطقة الشمالية يعني اللي هي سوريا الكبرى أو يعني الجزء شمال حيفا من سوريا الكبرى أن تكون منطقة نفوذ فرنسي لأن أرادوا الفرنسيين يكونوا بفر فرنسيين يكونوا فاصلين بينهم وبين الروس البرتين تصوروا أنه في نهاية الحرب إذا حزم الدولة العثمانية حتكون منطقة الأناضول أو شرق الأناضول منطقة نفوذ روسي فلم يكونوا يريدون مجاورة الروس. So you see, it's indispensable for the Arabs of inland Syria to have some direct access to the Mediterranean, somewhere along the Syrian coast. With Lebanon in the way and a total French control, that would be impossible. But that would mean French possessions would be split in two between the north and the south of Syria. That simply cannot be allowed to happen. The political and military administration would be impossible in such a divided territory. Well, Monsieur Picou, I am not convinced. But let us nevertheless try to meet that objection. Now, my dividing line is here, from Acre to Kirkuk. The British want to go from the Sahel to the Sahel to the Sahel. Because this is a 
وسريع نحو الهدف.